Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have an excellent interview today. We have the co-founder of Hosho, Hartaj Sani. And they specialize in blockchain security, which, if you know me, I am like, I wear a tinfoil sombrero when it comes to security. And uh, so I'm extremely excited about this interview. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So when we're talking about blockchain security, uh, we have we have multiple different areas. Perhaps you'd like to explain some of these for us. Yeah, so we started off with doing smart contract audits. So we realized that in this space, lots of smart contracts are being written. We firmly believe this is just the beginning of smart contracts revolutionizing the world in terms of cutting out middlemen. And we believe that smart contracts are going to be written on an array of protocols. Right now, we have an abundance of smart contracts being written specifically for ICOs because there is so much excitement about this funding mechanism. And it was because of that funding me mechanism mainly that my co-founder Yo Kwan and I realized that there's a shortage of people doing quality third-party audits on smart contracts. And by giving birth to this company Hosho, and Hosho, by the way, means security in Japanese, we realized that a, not, there's a shortage in the entire world for simply providing smart contract auditing as a service and eventually automating it more and more and more. But we began re getting inbound requests for penetration tests of websites. Um, we began re asking, saying, oh, well, if we can't afford the audit, any other suggestions on what we should do? We said, well, at the bare minimum, you gotta, you should host a bug bounty. And, then we realized that it would be really excellent to start bringing transparency to the space so we can actually verify for sophisticated investors' sake which ICO actually has gotten an audit or not. And so we have been building an API that we're partnering up with all the major ICO listing websites such as Token Market. Um, and Eat, Eat Scan. Eat Scan. We're talk, trying to talk to all the major players. We haven't actually... Uh, Solidified that yet, but with token market, <laughs> we have... Solidified, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, <laughs> even if you solidified it, even it might be you, immutable. <laughs> maybe immutable. <laughs> it's very funny. Crypto jokes. <laughs> yeah, it's so, like, uh, let's see, the, 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 the lower the entropy, the colder the storage. <laughs> Yeah, I'm full of them. Yeah, you have a lot of good ones. You get, this is like some, we got to give you some open mic time tonight at La Bitcoin. Um, yeah, we started ripping through these smart contracts and realizing that, holy crap, these need an audit. And even high quality teams with high quality MIT founding uh, engineers, well, you still need an audit. And sometimes we'd hear from teams, oh, well, one of the Ethereum co-founders single-handedly did an audit. Oh, Gavin? Um, <laughs> yes, we've seen some problems on that front. Um, and and any person with a security background, you know, my co-founder's previous company was LaunchKey. Yo's and LaunchKey leveraged multi-factor authentication to get rid of passwords. And they were the only company that was non-blockchain that Pantera invested in. And I remember Yo telling me, that at launch key, they always got a, not only sometimes a second and a third audit. Oh for yeah. Everything they did, you know, and that wasn't even crypto, right? Anybody with a security background understands this. And now in an ICO space, you have smart contracts that there's a permanence to this. You're talking about raising millions of dollars. You're talking about millions of dollars going through this smart contract. Yeah, I would highly recommend multiple audits and the good projects that have been coming to us. Often we're the second, if not the third auditor, and we're still finding vulnerabilities. And it's for an array of reasons. Sometimes it's 
Maybe the development team was being rushed because the founders are saying, oh, well, we need to go live with this ICO. Everybody who's listening oh, to this time, knows they, they that they this got a is time true. frame. They got a marketing time frame. Like you got to ship the code. That's right, and <laughs> regardless of what's in it, that's right. <laughs> when we gave birth to the company, the majority of the requests we were getting were, "Can this be rushed? Can you?" We were entertaining it because we were brand new, and we knew this is something that we need to be able to do. Um, but we began to build significant amounts of automated tooling to get faster and faster at finding the same security vulnerabilities because it's a good thing that people are using using pre-written contracts from people like Token Market because we're able to use a contract that was written properly by good quality engineers and we've already found some vulnerabilities and built tooling around it and so we're getting faster and better at finding vulnerabilities making sure the contract was written efficiently so doing a gas analysis and trying to see like can you use can you be more gas efficient in this contract and often we've been bringing 3 to 7x gas efficiency per oh, wow. contract and another one is static analysis and trying to automate that and then the last part is truly having our quality engineers wrap their entire brain around what the vision of this white paper is or the source of truth if it's not an ICO and does that match the actual smart contract? And believe you me, there's been a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, uh, yeah, the, the smart contract's not doing what the white paper says very, very often. And you have teams of quality founders that have outsourced both of those tasks to two separate human beings in separate parts of the world. So I, obviously there's going to be some discrepancy. Um, and yeah, we're, <laughs> Finding some very interesting vulnerabilities, some very scary vulnerabilities, and the people who value our audit the most are the exchanges. And the exchanges are the ones that are reading line by line of the audit because they're the ones who need to know that somebody put something scary in this smart contract in which perhaps the token founders who got the Genesis token have the power to move tokens from one wallet to the other or simply delete them without anyone's know knowing. This is a red flag that an exchange should know about. Well, yeah, I mean, you had uh, you'd kind of brought that up, and I was like, oh, like this particular token that uh, had sent me an email saying I should take a look at their ICO. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm not deep in the code like you guys are, but I was kind of looking at this and like, I didn't really like what was in Bancor. <laughs> and, and then you kind of seemed to ratify my own fears with it. Yes. So perhaps you could go a little bit into that. Like what exactly is take like what exactly is taking place there? It's the when you create a token and you've given the founders the Genesis tokens, you have decided that you've given the power to the token founders who have the Genesis to Genesis token to do something that whatever your reason is for putting this in the smart contract that's irrelevant. This is something that an exchange simply needs to know about. Well, yeah, I mean, if we're going to list this on Kraken, yes. I mean, because like when we when we went to list Namecoin on Kraken, for example, we went through the the protocol, found critical vulnerabilities in it, yes. contacted the Namecoin dev team privately. Yes, they didn't fix the vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. so we let the public know that there were vulnerabilities in the protocol. <laughs> They still didn't fix it. Yes. And so Kraken actually fixed the vulnerabilities in the yeah. Namecoin protocol. Oh so if God. you're an exchange, I mean, you can't have critical vulnerabilities in tokens that you're listing yeah. and you can't have balances getting changed yes. arbitrarily. Yep. So, I mean, is that what we're talking about with, with what's happening with, the, with these Genesis, uh, with, with Bancor that like, you, yes, you, that, you, that you that have a, mutable balances basically. That is the case with that project. And there's other projects that we have seen where the entire security audit actually came clean. And the one thing that was a problem was uh, this, what we refer to as God mode in the contract. And that's, a, that's something that maybe they put it in there on purpose. Maybe they think they have a reason for that to be in the smart contract, but we need to put that in the audit report. It needs to be highlighted. And I, I am 100% sure 
Kraken wants to know this. Bittrex wants to know this. They want to know this. Anybody who wants to list this token, you have to for fiduciary duty reasons. Yeah. You know, because otherwise you could have a mutable balance. Uh, on the, you can't rely on the blockchain, so why should you even list a token to begin with? Yes. If, because, I mean, oh, I, it's just so much potential legal liability for the exchanges. Yep. And now the next step we're taking is trying to bring transparency to the space in regards to security auditing, especially for ICOs. So we envision ourselves as this product being the VeriSign for crypto, where we, we are releasing an API, partnering up with major ICO listing platforms and saying, Look up an ICO through our API and you can transparently get, transparently get a link. Did this ICO get an audit? Yes or no with a link to all of the audit reports. And we want to work directly with the other players in the space that are doing quality audits so that we can set a standard to A, who is a quality auditor in the world because we want to encourage more of them to exist. We'll in fact send them deal flow. And on the other hand, for sophisticated investors out there, it's super important that they know that this smart contract actually has been audited and that the website got a pen test. And on the pen test regard, uh, me and you were laughing about it before, but... The oh, more- yeah, let's tell a war story about this. <laughs> Coin- so there's Coindash. Everyone knows Coindash. Um, the... They built the website in WordPress. Oh, WordPress has, <laughs> it's not Swiss cheese at all. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone with a security background looks at that and just chuckles. And my co-founder, Yo, um, it's a, his, his unique background is cybersecurity and crypto. He's been in the crypto space mining since, you know, 2010, 11, and uh, he's been deep into the space. Um, and his previous company was Coinsetter, the exchange out of New York. Which yeah, which got acquired Kraken, by Kraken. By yeah. Kraken. Yo, Yo was the one that was looking at smart contracts early on and realized himself that he needs to be auditing them because he was the managing partner of a crypto hedge fund in Vegas. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, it's it's a really unique time from someone with a security background to have taught themselves solidity and has a QA mindset to be a qualified engineer to do proper security auditing. And this is a, a problem in the space. And there's, this is also why there's not so many ho shows popping up. Um, we ourselves are facing a problem when it comes to hiring. Oh, and, like everybody trying to get yeah. developers in and, this space. And it's just it's a it's a unique um, a unique time where you're looking for a QA mindset, a security background, and they can teach themselves solidity, adversarial thinking, and solidity is upgrading its language on a weekly basis. Oh, which is just potential disaster. And when we find vulnerabilities based on the fact that the language is upgraded on a weekly basis, and we've had to have the engineers that are staying on top of the game, you know, we're finding vulnerabilities that there's a potential for tens of thousands of smart contracts on, like for example, Ethereum network. You can go on ETH scan, and now we can scan all tens of th- hundreds of thousands of smart contracts and say, well, we found this many thousand that all will have this vulnerability. And so we're exploring ways to have smart contracts consistently modern monitored um, by us. And that Coindash example, to go back to it, it was basically that Yo and I were, um, well, Yo had basically saw the website. He saw that it was in WordPress and he emailed them that night and said, "I it looks like your website has a security vulnerability and that someone has a potential to hack into it and change the hash for where the Ethereum is going to be sent. And the following morning by 8 or 9 a.m., they had already been hacked for between, I think, 10 and 12 million U.S. dollars worth of Ethereum in the exact same way that we had highlighted them over email. Um, and these are the type of examples for us that just make us feel like, okay, we need to make sure that every project's website is pen tested before the sophisticated investors invest that the smart contracts all have been audited these are things that hedge funds that are quality hedge funds should be reading line by line code and quality hedge funds should be relying on auditors big time in fact if i was running a full-time hedge fund i would do my diligence first and foremost by saying before we cut the check we require an audit and this is actually now happening. Yeah, or multiple. And multiple in my opinion, audits. I totally agree with you. Like, you know, first, you, you definitely want an audit because once you, you've been looking at the code so long, you need a fresh set of eyes. But then it's better to have multiple fresh set of eyes, in my opinion. That's right. <laughs> uh, We've been and, seeing things like 
infinite generation of tokens, uh, poor validations, you know, with the advent of token burning, which is either the deletion of tokens or the transfer of them to invalid ETH addresses, um, contract inheritance issues, logic flow issues, uh, function modifiers. There's a, a long list of some very, very scary... And these are just the common ones. <laughs> these, these are the most common ones, and they are actually all very, very scary. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's all fun and games until you lose ten million dollars, mm-hmm. thirty million dollars, hundred fifty million dollars. Is in parity now like three hundred and yeah. in Ethereum's value more more than three hundred and thirty million? Oh so. my gosh, it's just it's just really crazy. I mean, it, not only is it amateur hour, but it's like a whole it's whole it's a whole amateur clown car. <laughs> yes, yeah. in this space, you know. Along with this, I was I was on a panel at Coin Summit back in twenty fourteen, and I talked about how. You know, we have auditing standards in accounting, and then we have, we even have information system security standards. Hmm. And especially with blockchain and its role with triple entry bookkeeping and its merging with the accounting systems that'll happen down the road, we're going to need like blockchain security standards. Yes. I guess would be the way to say it. Do we have any type of stuff happening in this area? I, I think that's kind of what. In Uh, terms of standardizing, like, you know, what would be in these audit reports? It is one of the goals of ours, for sure, to be able to give better examples of the community of what a quality smart contract should look like. I mean, token market's taking a good step by releasing pre-written smart contracts. That's a good step to take instead of kind of starting from scratch. Yeah, but even the ERC-20, I mean, that's like... A request for comment, right? Yes. Like it's not meant to be a spec, from what I understand. <laughs> and yet everybody's like, "Oh, we have an ERC twenty token," and it's like, "This, this is a playground." <laughs> really? This is a well, playground. Yeah, Vitalik said it was a playground, right? Yes. Like Ethereum's a playground. And, yeah, and, and it, this is the example of why it behaves as one. And, uh, <laughs> and and from our perspective, you know, truly, we we are protocol agnostic. You know, the core of our work today is ICOs on Ethereum. More and more of our projects are companies putting the entire business core on smart contracts, cutting out big middlemen. Some of these middlemen are, or health, an interesting one is healthcare businesses writing smart contracts between the doctor and the patient, the patient and the healthcare provider, the insurance provider and the doctor, and making it clear in Having smart HIPAA contract. compliance, HIPAA needing, compliant. needing that HIPAA compliance in the in actual smart, smart contract of the yeah. code. And making sure that it's securely audited. That's super, super interesting stuff to us. And we're seeing more and more interesting projects that are not ICOs. And increasingly so, we're getting a demand to do security work for other protocols. Um, we plan on doing security work for RSK's protocol. Rootstock. Rootstock and IBM Hyperledger. Hyperledger. We got a few requests for NEO. Um, these are all very early, you know, let's see. We don't, yeah, but <laughs> how do you find the people who are even qualified to do this? I mean, like, you need, you need understanding of solidity. Then you're going to need understanding of Java. I mean... This How do we solve the problem? We all build academies. And the problem is I mean, I not guess all of us people, can build an in-house academy. I guess if investors are willing to pay enough for audits, then you know we'll eventually get enough talent. Yeah, right? the thing is, have you heard of Academy, the uh, academy with uh, Jason in, in, in L.A.? Uh, um, no, I'm not familiar. So these guys have started an academy. They're going to launch a token. It's actually called the Academy Token. And with that token, you pay for the coursework. It's the first U.S. accredited Solidity program. Accredited? By a uh, U.S. Uh, university. Oh, by a university? I believe it's a King's University or Kingsley wow. University. Huh. So I'm interested to work with people like them where we can help them make a top-tier course right. where someone maybe had a, solid, a security background and now we're teaching them uh, Solidity and they can come now work for us. Today, if there is someone qualified... They've already made so much money in crypto that it's hard to get them out of bed. Exactly. Or they're working on their own awesome yeah, they're project. Their own project. It, that needs to be audited. It needs to be audited. <laughs> and, the, or the third is, if you find American talent and you're an American company, chances are that person wants to get paid a lot of money because he is a solid engineer. And this is, again, assuming that he's, he or she is qualified enough to even pass the test of my engineers. 
My current engineers, I've been sending them people who come up to me after I give a talk at some meetup or oh, some conference and they go, oh, I'm a solid engineer. I want to work for you. And they're just failing the mark. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not at, easy to at, do what we do. At Armory, people couldn't even get past some of the initial math questions, let alone into the programming to get an interview. Yeah. So <laughs> this is not easy stuff. The issue I see there is if I hire someone in San Francisco today and he gets paid $250,000 a year, maybe plus equity to come be, come be uh, an auditor for Hosho, this person may want to jump ship to go work for a highly paid ICO at any time. Yeah. Because that's what they're being offered. They're being offered oh, premium dollar awesome. to go join the best big ICO, which is for encouraging more and more companies to have to go raise capital, whether it's a, a venture back traditional way of fundraising or coming up with some reason to have a token because you need the money. Because you, yes, you, that's the, that's so many companies. You're inventing a reason for a token because you want to do an ICO so you can get the money. And the thing is, one year from now, if not two max people like the academy and other academies like blockchain academy from brazil uh, these these people will hopefully succeed by training hundreds and hundreds of new people to be qualified solidity engineers which means that that person is being 300 getting paid 300k is might be facing a layoff because now we can find 15 of him or her for a much cheaper rate and uh it's just an interesting time. There's nowhere on this earth where we have an abundance of qualified engineering talent for this space right now, which means you have to be able to afford to hire, train, and retain. And when you're not venture funded, which right now we, we are not fun, uh, outside funded, we've been completely just running off of revenue, it's a big risk when you're, you don't have millions of dollars of budget in the bank to hire people and then fear that in six months you're not going to retain them. Or that in six months, they didn't meet the par to learn fast enough. What a, what are some other crazy war stories? You know, like, like how about this parody, <laughs> this parody uh, situation? Because, I mean, we've talked about ICOs, but what about the wallet software itself? Yeah, I mean... I mean, do you audit that stuff too? I mean, we're starting to explore it. Truly, we've been mostly laser focused on smart contracts for ICOs on Ethereum because that's been the bombardment of work. Um, but yeah, we, we will be doing audits of, of wallets as we move forward. Parity situation was irresponsibility on the sides uh, on, from the perspective of developers. The developers were irresponsible. And this was Gavin Wood was the CTO. He's the CTO. He, I mean, they should have, with him, right? They should have gotten multiple audits. And it seems like from the perspective of our engineering team, this was all very, very avoidable. The wallet library wasn't initialized properly, and there's just uh, blatant issues. I mean, so well, enough, some of our, our team might be attempting to go after some of those locked up funds, um, but we'll see. We'll keep you posted. Yeah, but but one of the problems with this is like, how do we know that the bug was was inadvertent or intentional? We don't. And in the in this case, where the hundred and fifty million dollars uh, worth of ether got locked up, you had one massive pull request that came in in January, got merged with pretty much no review. Yes. And obviously, the development took place somewhere else instead mm. of that repo. I mean, it just smells like a dead fish. Like, what if it was intentional to put that bug in there to then like hack and steal the funds later, and then blame it on a bug? I mean, that's the type of stuff we have to worry about. We have to worry with, about with it all and, of this, don't we? We have, to, we have to build alliances in which if we smell immorality, we have to ban people from the space. <laughs> like, more <laughs> of us have to come together to say we won't work with people that even have the sniff of immorality. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that other than that. We have to be moral and bring morality to the space or else it will not get sophisticated and fortune 500 companies won't build on these protocols if it continues to be a playground which is why they're entertaining conversations with r3 hyperledger maybe rsk like these conversations are happening because of the playground we're currently well, in i mean there's definitely an incentive to have your private blockchains or private federations but at the same time we saw the power of the internet versus the intranets Intran of like Prodigy and Genie and AOL. Yes. So I mean, okay, they they you know I I understand why a Fortune 500 company would want to stay 
in the safe private blockchain area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the security vulnerabilities are gone. They, it not. just means that it's less likely that someone might find one, yep. which is the situation everybody's currently in. Yes, that's correct. right. Yep. With with these big companies, that's correct. So, and why you know they they keep their their security vulnerabilities, and when they've been breached, they they like to keep that secret because it costs. 3% of market cap yep. if it gets disclosed publicly. Yep. And if it doesn't get disclosed publicly, it still costs 5 to $7 million on average for a security incident like Home Depot or Target or wherever internally. So, And they're not going to have as many commits and they're not going to have as many a community of developers going after finding bugs and collecting bounty. That's not going to happen on them. And this is, this is one of the problems with what we even looked at with Neo. Uh, you look at one Neo's GitHub and there's not that many commits. It's no matter how exciting that may be or the a futuristic protocol, it's still ghost town. Meanwhile, in Ethereum, you have thousands of the world's best devs fixing and trying and and putting commits yeah building a smart contracting language then you got the same thing going on at bitcoin building mm -hmm. an immutable blockchain yes now what i mean is there usually when we look at the security of our information systems there's margin for error you know that like and you build in an additional layer so that even if the first one gets breached like they aren't going to breach the second or the third one but with blockchain stuff it's literally like all or nothing, isn't it? I mean, there's just no margin for error. There's no margin for error, especially if it's a token sale. So you have a token generation event, and this cannot, this smart contract cannot be changed. And that's so, just the way it is. And that's just the way that, it is. Because code is law. Well, it is on Bitcoin it because is. it's immutable. It's immutable. But Ethereum, uh, maybe not so much. Not so you much. Know? But, I mean, if it's not a token sale and you put a smart contract up and you find a vulnerability later, that's still a better situation than if it's a token sale. Right, it's, it's, you can still make some changes. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. You can bring it down. Especially and, if you're in God mode. <laughs> yeah, especially if you have God mode. <laughs> right? But uh, yeah, it's people are raising millions of dollars in minutes and they don't take the time to value security. They're going to the auditors way too late and they're contacting us as auditors and saying, well, how much does it cost so they can bake it into their approximation to go do a private pre-sale of the ICO? Hedge funds only want access now to the private, private pre-sale where they get maximum bonus to participate in the ICO. Chances are, nowadays, the private pre-sales with maximum bonus, you don't have the have smart contract or the white paper written. Right. There's no smart contract written. What could I audit? <laughs> yeah. And And... You have companies that have now done two rounds of pre-ICO funding, millions of dollars raised, powerful team of ex-exited uh, co-founders, smart contract, not written, not audited. And the business itself obviously is not even making money, right? I mean, and that's like sadly the obvious part right now. Like, oh, yeah, no big deal. I mean, it's a bit different if you're talking about a company, 20 staff, they're generating revenue and they're pitching this concept about how they're tokenizing a part of their business and they're going to do a token generation event on it. But at least that business is paying its staff through revenue and it's running. And even if this TGE event doesn't go as smooth as they'd like, there's still a business. And you can, this is why I actually think more quality ICO projects will end up doing venture raising, traditional equity fundraising for the first two to three years and then evaluate a proper scaling ICO where they can actually get community, community, uh, crowd, sell, crowd sell yeah. and environment, get more people involved, have time for the audit and line it all up properly, have the budget to hire the best team, generate a real business. Um, well, you gotta, you gotta respect the private keys. Uh, there's kind of a joke. The reason for all these altcoins and ICOs is to, uh, acquire more Bitcoin, usually for the people doing them. <laughs> <laughs> That's one theory. <laughs> and, well, I mean, if we're going to be taking territory, like which blockchain do we take it on? I mean, Bitcoin's what you settle almost all this stuff into. Yes. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy to think that hundreds of millions of dollars are flowing into some of these ICOs where even the most rudimentary security hasn't been uh, analyzed. That's right. I, I mean, we had a, we we were at a conference in New York uh, back in I think 2013, 
and someone came up and asked our Armory dev, like, why should I use Armory? And he was like, because whoever steals your Bitcoin will. And so you're either going to respect the keys or you're not. I mean, do you see the market just weeding out people? Uh, you know, be, you know, if you're going to make poor capital allocation decisions because you, you have asymmetric knowledge and somebody put in a bug, quote unquote, that allows them to take all your coins. This is borderline a free market right now, right? Yeah, it's and, totally wild west. The, I mean, it's crazy. The benefits of a free market is are personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. <laughs> I think it's the equivalent of when a child burns his hand on the stove. The child learns a lesson to not put his hand on the stove after he burned it. In this space... And most people don't learn from watching someone else burn their hand on the stove. That's right. You, you, you never will. You can't teach the kid how bad it really will burn. Like I can tell the kid, hey, you put your hand on the stove, you're going to burn yourself. He's, he or she is still going to... Needs to do that the right amount <laughs> to never do it again. <laughs> right. That's the ICO space right now, really. It's... It, the funding mechanism of ICOs is not going anywhere, in my opinion. That mechanism is enabling human beings around the world to raise capital from in anyone. In totally new ways. In a whole I mean, new it's way. really innovative and, and interesting. When, you, when you're not American, you're in Kiev, Ukraine, Moscow, Russia. People for because of Silicon Valley have been saying, if you want to run a successful technology company, well, you got to make sure you have at least one your HQ in San Francisco, if not Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's been the norm. Not anymore. So I can completely understand why Kiev, Ukraine, and and uh, Russia and South Korea, and there's just so many ICOs, Tel Aviv. Right? These are all places that are not in America, being run by non-Americans. And if I were them, I wouldn't even involve any Americans. And ideally, find a way to block American U.S. dollars because then you're outside of SEC jurisdiction. Uh-huh. And a growing number of crypto hedge funds here are not going to be able to participate in a lot of ICO sales and a lot of different projects, mainly because they are American. So this is a this Bitcoin and blockchain technology, it's a global phenomenon. You would say it is one hundred percent. It's one hundred percent a global phenomenon, and it's the most enabling for those people whose governments have been screwing them the hardest. Brazil, China, Russia, Argentina, <laughs> Argentina, Venezuela. You know the in, have you heard of the index of economic freedom? Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. So it's one of my favorite indexes by the World Heritage Forum. And yesterday, I was hanging out with an Argentine, a Slovak, a Russian, and we basically were bantering about a few different things about why there should be revolution and we were discussing about how Venezuela launched a cryptocurrency and how Argentina should be next. And it's amazing to me that more revolution is not being encouraged in Argentina because on that list of economic freedom, mind you, the United States is number 17 after President Obama, regardless of how you feel about him. We dropped down maybe five to seven yeah. in that list after that, after his presidency. And you know, Hong Kong is number one, Singapore is number two, there's New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Canada. These are all top 10 in, in terms of the ability for someone to pursue their individual uh, happiness and uh, pursuit of wealth based on Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations. Which is, you know, there's a direct correlation between economic freedom and economic output. Correct. And so, I mean, people wonder like, oh, why is there such a bad recession in the U.S.? Well... Well, it's because you can't do do as much stuff. You can't do as much. You stuff. have less choices, and anytime you have less choices, you you are not as rich. In Argentina, they're number one hundred and fifty seven oh, on that goodness. list. I was in shock. The the countries below and above Argentina were like Iran and <laughs> Uzbekistan. Like wow, wow. wow. You know, we, we talk about Argentina. RSK is based in Buenos Aires, right? Rootstock is based there. My ex, my ex co-founder, Gal Dolber for Zaldi.com is based in Rosario, Argentina. We're hiring and finding some of the world's best technical talent in Argentina. Meanwhile, on the index of economic freedom, they're next to Iran. <laughs> and, and yet they're able to route around all this stuff with this new, these new internet protocols that transfer value over communications channels. Yes. Effectively. I like, think that they, like they feel they, they, more... They might be physically in Argentina, but really they're in cyberspace. That's correct. Right? They're decentralized. <laughs> yeah, they're decentralizing. What's uh, maybe another war story or two <laughs> before um, we end? 
Uh, let we me just had so much fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's lots of war stories. I mean, we have this one slide in our in wrestling presentation where we highlight all the big hacks. You know, approximately 10% of all money in the ICO space has been lost or stolen. <laughs> well, that's an expensive tax. I feel like that's a nice big fact to paint the picture to people. That 10% of all the money has been lost or stolen. And we show parody. We show DAO. Bittrex, Coindash, and now there's a bunch more. There's a, a bunch more that just keep popping up. <laughs> and, and every single one of them could have been solved through by an audit. With an audit, yeah. Every single one of them. And it, this mind boggles us. And we're just like, well, we know we have a great business. We have our problems because we need to scale and scale really fast because the demand is unbelievable in the blockchain security space. Um I'm trying to think about, is there any more clear war stories well, that I could so, tell you? So here's, here's one I got for you. Hmm. Um, I was talking with Eric Lombroso. He's a Bitcoin core developer since like 2011. And he started a new project, ChainSplit. Uh, it's chains.it. And what they're going to do there is you're going to be able to cre- create unsigned transactions for all the different Bitcoin forks. Now, the, the issue is going to be like having wallets that are safe to sign with, hmm. right? Uh is that something that might fit into your wheelhouse? Because we have all these forks, you know, and I think Bitcoin Gold even had malware up on BitcoinGold.org uh, that, and somebody lost 36 Bitcoins because he hadn't moved them first. But even if he had moved those, he might have lost his Bitcoin Diamond or his Bitcoin Platinum or like whatever it, to whatever be honest, it is. We're right? thinking, to be honest, there's, it's such a shit show in the space that you just said, especially with wallets, that we are very much thinking about launching our own wallet. Yeah, I mean, supporting these forks and like just so people could liquidate the, yes. the coins out of there. I mean, it just seems like it's really it, the, the there's a need for a moral police. Well, well, there's there's actually incentive, you know, to to put out wallets and forks that intentionally like compromise and and steal people's bitcoins. That's correct. So yeah, I mean, it you know that that might be a, a good white hat. You know, just a tip. I mean, my own self interest no, is yeah, like, hey, I want to, I want to sell my Bitcoin gold, but uh, I just don't trust any of these wallets, so it's just wallets. going to sit there. That's correct. You know, but having you know somebody like yourself and maybe some of the other auditing players in the space, they can kind of go over it with another set of eyes and be like, oh yeah, you can you can sell these forks with, you know, use this wallet, get get the unsigned transaction. That way, you don't even have to run the full node yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's just be kind of wish list from me. You know. Yeah. Um, Anything else you want to mention before we uh, before we close the interview? It's just been totally fascinating. It's been super fun talking to you. Yeah, Thanks super so much. fun. Totally shot, fascinating. Shout out to all the Bitcoin KN fans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we talk about uh, you know we've talked about Dash. We've talked about some of the other uh, altcoins out there, Ethereum. I think the overall synopsis I could give to to the listeners is really keep an eye out on security. Look for companies that are building core infrastructure that will stay over the next few decades of this space. That we are in such a early time. I, I truly believe this is like 1993 to the internet is kind of where we are today in crypto. That there is core pieces of infrastructure technology. You know, the saying for Hosho when we started, it was, you know, we, we're selling shovels. You know, we're not the gold diggers uh, launching an ICO. Our, the first question we got when we launched this was, sorry, what's it, when are you going to do the ICO? And like, what? Well, <laughs> We don't have a reason like, to no, have a token. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, we, we will automate more and more during the audit. We will leverage blockchain technology, but we will never launch a token. I'll drop my phone. There's no reason to have a, a token for us. And um, this is also a question for us to ask other people that are launching an ICO. Why do you have a token? <laughs> so that I can get your bitcoins <laughs> and or, or your ether. And if that's your answer, <laughs> time to reevaluate. Exactly. I feel less bad when your non-US citizens all in some other country that are super honest and are like, "Hey, look, we legitimately just want the money from the <laughs> ICO." It's like, "Well, I can kind of see your perspective, but still this is a problem for the community, for the space. Right. It's a global community." Right? And um no matter what, internationally, when you write a smart contract, whether it's for an ICO or for uh, getting rid of middlemen for the core of your business, value it and audit. And this is what we say to all of the top hedge funds in the game, many of them who we partner with, and we work closely with a lot of the biggest hedge funds, 
and increasingly so some venture capital shops because they're investing and in taking in equity you know, even shapeshift did a traditional VC equity round and now we're going to do an audit for Prism and we'll be the third auditor. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to sharing with everyone how that comes out. We're the third auditor on Prism. So to be seen, like, do we find more vulnerabilities in the previous two auditors? Chances are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not, to, not to ambush you, but often I'm asked, like, oh, how do I secure my Bitcoin? I've got kind of four main steps for people. One is you run Bitcoin Core for full validation with a full node. I would agree. Two, uh, you manage your private keys with Armory uh, on an offline cold storage laptop. Hmm. Three, the Glacier Protocol, glacierprotocol.org. It's like 95-page uh, paper. It tries to go over all the OPSEC. I don't know if you've come across it or not. Yes? Yes. Uh, and then four, for the actual hardware device, use a Purism laptop. P-U-R-I dot S-M laptop. So what do you think of those four steps? I think those are interesting steps. I think the only things I would possibly change in there are I would use launch key for my passwords. Um, I am a little biased because my co-founder is the inventor and architect of that technology, but it works great. Launch key for passwords and a tracer, multiple tracers. I like tracers. Prefer I, prefer like a Bitcoin dedicated hardware wallet, like a tracer versus running like Armory on a on a Purism laptop that doesn't even have Wi Fi in it. And it is off completely offline. Like completely I mean, yeah, offline. your your scenario sounds cool. This is not my core expertise. So it's not something that I'm always giving advice on. But yeah, it sounds like you have a secure method. I use LaunchKey, but yes, tracers do. Tracer is a very secure. I like the tracers open source. Uh huh. Technically, Ledger is not. Um, so that's my input. There is use tracers, use launch key. Use well, what are, what about the distinguishment between maybe a paper wallet? Between well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we say like paper wallet or hardware wallet, but what do we actually mean? And like with Ledger or Trezor, we're talking about a Bitcoin specific hardware device, as opposed to like a Purism laptop that is general purpose. And so, like, it, it might be easier to compromise something on a Bitcoin specific hardware device? I mean, they have shown every... I mean, there was a DEF CON presentation about they like fixed pulling that private keys. They pulled private keys in Tracer and then Tracer fixed that. Yeah, but still, if you're dealing with like a general purpose computer, like a Purism, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, it's no, like full disk encrypted, like Linux, it's hard no S, it's got no networking devices, it's got no networking like uh, protocols in it either. What I'll do for you is I will release... Our team will evaluate this discussion and we'll release on behalf of Ho Show our what we think is the best practices. Yeah. Because this is the kind of this is the kind of discussion that I feel like I, I mean can't, I, I, I might can't, poke poke holes in it wherever I, you can. No, I yeah, <laughs> I I just don't like offering ultimate truths in this discussion. Right. I like to talk to lots of people who are smarter than me. And then we all come together and go, well, at this second today, in this 2017, like the hardest way to steal this Bitcoin looks the hardest someone. way to build Bitcoin. <laughs> and you need a bunch of white hats to think really in a unique way. <laughs> right. Yes. It's something that I want to be speaking more on, and I'll get back to you. Yeah, I know there's a tremendous amount of uh, just demand for knowledge in the space because, I mean, we've looked at Mt. Gox and Bitfinex, and like there's who knows how many posts on reddit about like bitcoin just disappearing out of uh yeah. <laughs> blockchain.info or like wherever i mean i have a friend he lost uh you know over a million dollars out of his blockchain.info wallet yeah i mean the um, average new adopter feels like they're safe with their new coindesk wallet the, <laughs> yeah. the vault yeah the coinbase vault, vault or whatever it is that, that's the like, that's the majority of the new adopters that is the majority i would say yeah the, and it's just scary because you mean I've been rambling about Bitcoin on Snapchat and Instagram for so long that as the price has gone up to 300 to 500 and now 11,000, uh, more and more people reach out to me and they're like, hey, so is it too late? Or <laughs> I just bought some Ethereum, um, you know, how do I store it? Or and I, I, and I asked like, them, well, where is it? It's always, sitting, kind of difficult. <laughs> it's always sitting on an exchange. Yeah, all these exactly. people that I'm that are reaching out to me, all the new ones, they've all left their money sitting on an exchange, and then you tell them, I suggest buying a hardware wallet or ex ex at least start with a paper wallet or set up Mist, and there's 
not enough information out there publicly for them to figure it out. And then when they Google it, they found some blog, but half of the stuff's not making sense of them. And then they forget their own passwords and <laughs> they haven't been even been doing 2FA. 2FA is not even common. Oh, right but now. even if you do 2FA, I mean, at Kraken, we released a 56 point uh, on how to properly secure your 2FA because, like, you could get your number ported, mm-hmm. uh, all types of, I mean, they're just on land, the number porting, they're landmines everywhere. I will give your users a little uh, piece of advice. I found having a second phone from Google Fi. Yeah, be great for my two FA. Yeah, that's that's actually in that that step that fifty six step part yeah. in Kraken is like you have to get like a burner phone basically, and and then that and then you you keep that burner phone inside of a Faraday cage mm-hmm. that you've bought off Amazon, you uh-huh. know, and so like, <laughs> but I mean my my buddy that lost a million dollars of Bitcoin, which today would be like twenty five million dollars. It's like a big what if, right? It's kind yeah. of sad. But he took personal responsibility when he had $100 of Bitcoin, he was putting in $100 of thought. But when he had a million dollars of Bitcoin, he was still only putting in $100 of thought into securing it. That's right. And so, you know, as the price goes up, you got to take this stuff more seriously. Yes. Uh, or, you know, whoever steals your Bitcoin, <laughs> they've taken it seriously. Yep. And that's something else that we all need to be thinking about is um the danger that those people who are in this space as thought leaders that them and their families now face and that yeah. that that that's right in line with the topic of how are you securing your crypto um there's now stories more and more that i'm hearing of people and their wives being kidnapped yeah this I is mean, a reality and none of us are figuring out what is the solution other than 24 7 armed guards around all yeah, of us <laughs> i mean like in our case uh i mean that's one of the reasons uh, funding armory. So, I mean, we have fragmented backups. We have, uh, we, so, so you're actually splitting up the key. Then you can have multi-sig with, with, uh, with the wallets. And so like in my case, we have to have multiple people in multiple, at the same time in multiple different physical ju- jurisdictions in order to get to private keys and move them around. Yep. And so it's like, it's just not possible to get to the keys, even if we wanted to without certain people there. Uh, and I think we're we're going we're going to increasingly see that with big custodians, yeah. uh, you know, like whether it's Coinbase or whoever. I mean, you, you just one you have to have the segregation of the duties, but then you have to be able to roll the keys and have like the different quorums and stuff like that for when people to leave the organizations. Uh, I think Tracer did a good job at allowing us to leverage the Tracer for password usage. So you get stopped by border security, and they say, "Well, there's a crypto wallet. There's that more than 10k worth of USD on right. there. Open it up." And you open it up, and you're like, "No, oh, this is just for my passwords." Yeah, mm-hmm. or or yeah, it's kind of scary having the plausible deniability built in there because I mean, you could put in a different password, kind of like TrueCrypt had. Yes. you know, you could put in like one password or another password, and you get you have like different the things secret, show up. You have the secret uh, file in there, but you the the secret volume, but you have no way to to know that there's a secret volume in there. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we'll see a lot more of this type of stuff too. Um, and we, yeah, we look forward to growing in the space. We look forward to people looking for our GPG sign of approval on a smart contract, looking forward to working with the regulators for, and we're looking forward to working with lawyers, you know, like shops like Morrison Forrester in New York, MoFo, they have 75 dedicated blockchain lawyers. Wow. Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, Rosati, they have a, a solid number of blockchain lawyers in the DC office, Cooley, we're trying to partner with all the major people that are evaluating a smart contract for an array of things. And it's awesome to sit with the lawyers when they've ripped through it and they've said, look, you're American citizens. This is definitely a security. <laughs> um, okay, fix this, 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 and that. And you have to get this audited, you know? Yeah. And that this is the kind of behavior that we want. We want there to be a, a paradigm shift in the way people are thinking about this. And... Slowly, we'll, we, we're seeing better and better projects. And if we see bad projects where it's clearly a scam coin, we're still going to audit it. But your audit report is going to be way, <laughs> it's gonna way be a more. bunch of Fs. There's going to be a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Big red flags. Yeah. Say, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, be careful who you send your, uh, your, your intro to because they might just, uh, take a look at it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, we've had, we've, we've gone well beyond our usual time frame, but it's just been such a fascinating discussion. Yeah. Uh, Hartish Sani. Yes. Uh, co-founder of Hosho. They yeah. focus on blockchain security. 
you. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, man. Okay. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.